Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the Cumberland River Compact, we are an environmental organization. We are based here in Nashville, and our mission is to enhance the health and enjoyment of the Cumberland River and its tributaries through education, collaboration, and action. So we work on root causes of water pollution issues in both urban and rural areas. I know many of you are uh, familiar with our organization, but there are also a lot of um, new faces today as well. So always like to add in a little watershed explanation as to where we are. So the Cumberland River watershed is 18,000 square miles of land between both Tennessee and Kentucky. The headwaters of our river starts near uh, the border with Virginia and Kentucky in that Appalachian area, moves down through Kentucky into Tennessee and back into Kentucky. So as you can see across this landscape, a lot of different types of land, a lot of different types of communities that our organization works to uh, works collaboratively with to address uh, water and environmental issues. So our work um, falls into four main areas. So our education programming, restoration work, work in urban waters, and work on working lands, which are sustain our programs in sustainable agriculture, as well as programs that address um, reforestation on mine lands. So again, across all of these programs, our goal is to address the root causes of water quality issues and also to um, uh, work co constructively with governments, communities, and other organizations to address water and environmental issues in our region. Uh, but today we're going to be talking uh, very uh, specifically about one and uh, sort of a new area of our programming, which is um, Hills Island. So Hills Island represents uh, to us a very unique and physical manifestation of our mission of those four areas. So Hills Island is located in Davidson County and it was gifted to the Cumberland River Compact by 10 Green Land Conservancy in June of 2021. So this is a very recent thing for us. Um, Hills Island is about 20 acres of land. It's very wooded in the Cumberland River, uh, it stretches nearly a half mile near Neely's Bend just before the Old Hickory Bridge. Um, and since the island um, was acquired by 10 Green, it has been envisioned to be used as a space for education, recreation, stewardship, and research. And the compact is committed to that vision becoming a reality. So just a little more place setting as to where Hills Island is today. Um, you can see the Cumberland River there um, kind of snaking around from downtown, you know, uh, Inglewood, East Nashville, around Neely's Bend uh, to right before the Old Hickory Bridge. So that is the location we're talking about. So Hills Island has a lot of different um, components to it that we'll talk about today. Um, one of them is, of course, the ecology of this island. It offers an opportunity to understand the river and its biodiversity more. Uh, river islands are found across many major waterways and showcase how land and water interacts. Also, of course, providing important and separated habitat for plants and animals. Um, although we haven't done a full biological inventory of Hills Island, we know it's home to groves of pawpaw trees, sycamores, red maples, hackberries. There's evidence of deer, turkey, herons, raccoons, snakes, otters. We saw a bald eagle fly over when we were there as well. So really a unique ecological space. Um, of course, due to kind of the, the location of where it is and how the, the river rises and falls, there is some debris and some trash that um, is located on the island. Um, the island does have some really old large trees, but also some evidence that it's been cleared in the past as well, which uh, we'll talk more about kind of the history today. So just sort of setting um, this conversation in context of Hills Island as a whole, um, Hills Island really represents a long-term commitment for the Cumberland River Compact. So as we aim towards this um, area for research, education, and stewardship, we recognize that there are a lot of intermediary steps in, in getting there. Um, and in particular, we wanted to um, understand more about the cultural and history of this island. So as we learned more about the island and its history, uh, we became particularly interested in how 
enslaved and formerly enslaved peoples may have interacted with the island. Um, there was one story of a, a man named George that piqued our interest, and I won't uh, share too much about George because I'll let Dr. Williams talk more about that, but he was one of the few people that we had um, written record of being on the island, uh, but we felt like we didn't know a lot about him other than, um, you know, some um, words from from a, a autobiography, which we'll talk about today. And so we wanted to understand more about him and understand the story of him in context um, to the time period. And so we recognize that as a steward of the land, we also were stewards of this history. So we first kind of committed to understanding this history of the island, um, particularly Black and Indigenous histories, before we move towards that ecological knowledge. So um, like I mentioned before, we haven't done that biological inventory. We haven't started on you know, stewardship and restoration and invasive species removal, um, but we know that those are sort of the next steps as we move towards activating that that space. So one of the exciting things, you're going to hear a lot of information today um, about sort of Hills Island, and we have a new website that just launched that's available through the Cumberland River Compacts website that has a lot of this information in it. So this is a multimedia web page that includes a lot of the history you're going to hear about today, as well as some of the uh, introductory ecological information that we know. And uh, much of the work of Dr. Williams that you will hear about today is included within this website, as well as recordings of other experts talking about um, the history of Hills Island. So I uh, definitely encourage you to check that out and keep checking that out as we learn more about Hills Island and we um, share this story more as well. All right, so I wanted to get us started for today um, and um, recognize that with this sort of commitment and understanding uh, to understanding and sharing the cultural history in mind, um, we were excited to work with Dr. Lee Williams Jr. of Tennessee State University. So through a Sustaining the Humanities with the American Rescue Plan grant from the Humanities Tennessee, we were able to understand this history and build these interpretive resources for the greater Nashville community. Um, before I introduce Dr. Williams, I do want to take a quick moment to thank others who have helped make this project a success. Um, including the Tennessee State Museum staff, particularly Jeff Sellers and Miranda Fraley, Aaron Dieterwolf of the Tennessee Division of Archaeology, Steve Harouche and Andrea Tudhope of WPLN, and Andrew Otrowski of the Pontoon Saloon, who graciously lets us use his boat to get out to this island. <laughs> So without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Lee Williams, Jr. He is a scholar of African-American Civil War and Reconstruction and Public History at Tennessee State University. Williams has worked as a historic site specialist for the state of Florida, acted as a coordinator for the African-American Studies Program at Armstrong Atlantic State University, and served as trustee of the historic Savannah Foundation in Savannah, Georgia. He also spearheads the North Nashville Heritage Project, an effort that seeks to encourage a greater understanding of the history of North Nashville, including but not limited to Jefferson Street and its historic relationship to the greater Nashville community. So it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Williams and let him take the conversation from here. So thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for um, coming out. I want to talk a little bit about um, a space in Nashville that it, in many ways it reflects the city's African-American history in that it is a place that was right there under our noses, but we never really comprehended just how important it was. Um, let me try to share my screen and if we can, if I can do that, we'll get this conversation started. First, feel like I must apologize because the slides, whenever I make a slideshow, it looks perfect in my computer, but when it comes to the big screen, there's a lot to be desired. Um, but this, this first slide is just an old map of Nashville. The, it was the earliest map that I could find that referenced Hills Island. Um, 
But just to give you all a visual of what it looks like, I, um, I live in Hermitage and I go across this bridge all the time. This is the, for those of y'all that are familiar with the area, this is the old Hickory Bridge. You know, you're going into old Hickory, heading toward Madison. Um, the next time you're going across that bridge, if you look to the left, uh, you may be able to see Hills Island sticking out um, a little bit to your left. And when I first figured out where it was at, I was like, wow, I go by here all the time and I never saw it. And it, it turns out that um, of all of the spaces that I have looked at, in Nashville since I arrived here in 2009, this may very well be one of the most interesting and um, arguably one that will cause me to rethink what early Nashville looked like, particularly early African-American Nashville. Um, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, my student assistant, um, Jasmine Sears, who has taken a moment to, from her busy studies to look at a lot of this information that I'm working on. And um, she was um, nice enough to even accompany us out there on the trip. So I don't know if she's on this particular call, but if she's if she is, thank you. And also Carol Busey, who is the Metro County historian who has not blocked my number evidently, despite all of the calls that I make to her from time to time asking for clarity on a lot of these issues. But nonetheless, thank you to, um, to these two women. Okay, um, Hills Island, um, if we are going to give a true assessment of its history, we have to include it as, as part of the area that um, was originally um, inhabited by, um, by Native Americans. My friend um, Albert Bender in his work has argued that this area, this part of Middle, Middle Tennessee has been the home of um, Native Americans for more than 14,000 years. So we would be remiss to discuss this topic without mentioning them because they were the initial people to experience this island, to perhaps visit this island, to hunt on this island. But nonetheless, um, the early history of the property remains sketchy to this day because even after Donaldson and, and James Robertson come to this area and they decide that, you know, this part of the Cumberland would be a nice place to settle, there's not a whole lot of written records about this area. And even those that we have are a bit spotty. But what I was able to find was that um, the first real account that we have of this area is a description by a lady named Emily Donaldson in, in her diary. And as we probe through this diary, she, um, she mentions Cleveland Hall. As a matter of fact, she has a whole chapter or section on Cleveland Hall. This was another space that was hidden in, in plain sight. I remember um, driving, I was heading toward, um, heading past Andrew Jackson's Hermitage on my way to Old Hickory. And then I was trying to figure out where this place could possibly be. And I, I looked over to um, my left and I saw what looked like it ought to be a driveway. As I turned in there, I saw this photograph of this house. I mean, I saw this house and I immediately recognized the pillars because this was from a photograph that I had seen of the house um, 
in in Donaldson's diary, and I went and looked at the National Register nomination as well. So I was really excited. I pulled up in my truck and I looked, and I was like, okay, the gate is locked. But you know, that fence is kind of low. I probably could skip across there and grab some pictures, but I refrain from doing that because I didn't want to catch any trespassing charges or anything like that. But um, I'm working on gaining access to this space because this property, which was owned by a man named Stockley Donaldson, um, was the home of many enslaved African-Americans, one of which we know lived on Hills Island. So all that is to say this, um, Donaldson was the first owner of the property. Donaldson from, he lived from 1805 to 1888 and um, he became a very well-respected and wealthy man in the community. Um, I initially looked at him as, um, a businessman, but then I remembered a statement that I oftentimes tell my students, and that is this area's first big business, Nashville or Davidson County's first big business was slavery. So I began to look at his wealth in terms of the acreage he had, um, the acreage that he paid taxes for, and then the number of people that he had enslaved. And I found something I think was really interesting. Now, I know you guys can barely see these numbers because I have them right in front of me and I can barely see them. So I'll, I'll read them to you. Uh, Donaldson was, and this is from the 1830s. According to the tax records, he owned about 1,200 acres of land that was valued at $18,000. Similarly, at this time, he owned 35 Africans. He uh, enslaved 35 African Americans, and their value was $17,500. They got me to thinking, it was like, wow, so these 35 people that he owned at this time was worth almost as much as all of the land that he owned. So we began looking at that this, this, this particular property as a, a space that was valuable, a space that was inhabited by people that whose value almost equaled all of the land that he had together. But this is looking at them in economic terms. And I was really interested, what I wanted to know was how they may have seen this land, how what they experienced. Um, I wanted to be able to look at the area through their eyes. And that was kind of tricky, um, especially for those of y'all that have tried to study African-American history. You, re you realize that there's not much written by the enslaved, everything that we, hear about them is often from the outside in. So this was a mystery that we had to try to unravel. So the first real evidence or account that we have of the enslaved people that lived there came by way of um, Donaldson's daughter, Emily Donaldson Walton. Um, Toward the end of her life, she wrote an autobiography on um, that described life on that plantation. And then she talked about um, Hermitage and Donaldson and other areas. Um, but even given that it was, there was a little bit of a problem. There was something I had to grapple with, right? And that this is essentially an elderly woman who is discussing childhood memories. And I don't know about you guys, but um, as I get older, uh, my memory is not what it used to be, right? Um, 
sometimes I remember things as being better than they were. And then sometimes I, I, I suffer from amnesia. There are things that I omit. But this was all we had to go on. So Emily Donaldson, in her diary, she talks about the construction of this house in, um, during the 1830s, 1839, if I remember correctly. And she talked about how it was, by, it was built by the enslaved population. So right there, that tells me that the people that were living there, you know, you have your farmers, but you also have a population that is skilled, that, is, that was very skilled because those same bricks that they made, those, those floors that they may have put in that house, um, the framing that the carpenters may have done is still there. So that suggests that this population was skilled. She talks about how the women on this plantation may have um, participated in the making of the clothing and so forth. So this, this, this tells me that this population was very skilled. And, and in this, she talks about them having a great number of slaves whose food and clothes as well as all of their own clothes was produced on that place. So it's a self-contained place. Now, why am I hammering at this? Why am I throwing all this up right now? It's because it's this one enslaved man that, um, um, that lived there that I wanna draw your attention to. And this was, um, this was an enslaved man that was known as Uncle Guinea George. This particular man, according to her story, was a very frightening man, right? Because she said that um, um, his appearance was one that troubled everybody on the plantation. And according to her account, she said that George told them that he had been a cannibal um, back in Africa and that his teeth had been sharpened so he could chew better. Now I read this and I thought it was amusing because um, I, I know that in certain parts of Africa, um, um, some of the cultures do sharpen their teeth, but it's not attributed to cannibalism. Um, in some places, it's it's um, a demonstrated rite of passage. In some places, it could be um, a form of identity. Like some of y'all may be familiar with um, scarification that serves to identify people. Um, so when we look at this, you take it kind of tongue in cheek. And when I immediately read it, I thought maybe George told this story so that he could um, perhaps keep people at arm distance. But it, it works out to his benefit because according to Donaldson, she says that every spring he would leave the plantation and go over on an island in the Cumberland River that belonged to my father and later sold to my uncle, John Lawrence. He said that he would stay there all summer and he would come home in the fall of the year, bringing sacks of dried fruits and nuts, having camped out all summer. In fact, he seemed to be a law unto, unto himself. Most of the darkies were afraid of him, so were we children. Now, I found this statement to be interesting because it um, this was a an individual that was different from um, any other people on that plantation and that his origins very well may have been Africa. I know in one account that I found, it was discussed that sometimes he would be on the plantation, you know, singing songs in his native language. So in essence, he's, living on this island during a part of the year and then he returns right about the time if he's returning in the fall he's returning right about the time when the cotton is to be harvest harvested 
but somehow or another, he has been either sequestered or he managed to get his enslavers to allow him to spend time for himself on those 20 acres of land. Um, I really wrestled with whether or not he was forced to live out there or not, because it, it, it seems as though, you know, it, it was a situation where he was compelled to live there. But when, I remember when we made our visit out to the island and as we walked around, I looked to see how far the shore was from, um, from uh, each side of the island. And I remember telling, um, I remember telling Jasmine that in my younger days, I probably could swim that area. I could swim that distance if, if the, the current wasn't too strong. So I'm not sure, and I am, this is something, a part of the story that we're still grappling with. And that is whether or not he was there by force or there by choice. But that said, he is one of the earliest, if not the only person that we have a written record of that has been on that island. But as we moved a bit further, I wanted to, um, you know, to try to confirm that this young girl saw what she saw. So I went to uh, Mary Donaldson's will and I struggled through um, all of this script here and, and, and I had some assistance from my, my student, but we were able to find some names that um, appear in this document that seems to confirm what Emily Donaldson saw. That is, we found these names, Jim, Ben, Camus, Frank, and then there's George. And you have someone laying cross right, and his family, then Jimmy and Sarah and her family. So there we have established it. He's there. We know that he was um, a hunter. We know that he was engaged in um, agrarian work because he would come back to the harvest. He had to have some school, some skills, because if he was out there for any considerable amount of time by himself, he would have had to perhaps build some structures to in, in which to live. So we have a brief sketch of Mr. George and um, with him being a part of the Donaldson plantation, this is the way I'm going to look at it going forward because he's part of that community. So the more that I can learn about that community, it will tell me, it will provide me more information about George and what he might have been like. But this island is, is not named Donaldson Island, right? It's called Hills Island. So where did that name come from? name is associated with um, a gentleman named Harry R.W. Hill. Harry Hill. Harry Hill is an interesting figure because he was, during the time that he lived, one of Nashville's most successful businessmen. But when we talk about businesses in Nashville, you don't really, Hill's name, doesn't come up. I know that I remember going to the city cemetery a few weeks ago um, for its bicentennial celebration and his son is buried at a very prominent location at the cemetery right in front of the um, the red brick structure. You have a hill there. But what about his father? Well, his father was born in North Carolina but he moves to Middle Tennessee um, when he's about five years old. He moves to Franklin. As a boy, he's able to gain employment um, at a local store in, in Franklin, and um, he develops 
a keen head for business. So much so that by the um, by the early to mid 1820s, he moves to Nashville and sets up shop here. And he becomes very successful. He's an entrepreneur, he's a businessman, a very devoutly religious man. Um, we find evidence of him being involved in the establishment of, um, of McKendry over there on Church Street. He becomes a part of a group that, um, that creates what would become known as Franklin Pike. He becomes a merchant. Now bear in mind, let's put this all into a little bit of context here. Nashville as a city is beginning to take off. Its economy is beginning to take off at this time. And a lot of it has to do with the growth and expansion of slavery in the, in the territories. Let me bear in mind that during the 1790s, you have a revolution in Haiti. Um, you have Eli Whitney patenting the cotton gin. And then by the turn of the century, you have the United States by purchasing what becomes known as the Louisiana Territory, thus creating an empire for slavery. Nashville is perfectly situated to benefit from this because as it sits on the Cumberland, it provides a way to ship goods and people to the deep south. So Memphis and Nashville's economies take off at this time as, as they become very prosperous slave ports. Nashville becomes the most important slave port in, in the volunteer state and excuse me, Memphis becomes the most important slave port in the volunteer state, followed by Nashville. Um, I humbly submit to you all that this this um, the the purchase and the buying and selling of African Americans during this period became became Nashville's first big business. Then by the 1840s, by the 1850s, as, 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 um, as Hill's businesses really began to take off um, in terms of America's foreign trade, um, cotton would become our most, most valuable export. By the 1840s, about, cotton represented about what, over 50% of all US exports. So all that is to say this, the business that Hill was involved in was one that was very lucrative, um, one that contributed greatly to his riches. Because bear in mind, he's not only involved in the slave trade, but he's involved in shipping cotton. He's involved in buying and selling the goods that's necessary to maintain it, to maintain the institution. And his name begins to pop up everywhere. Um, on one hand, it, at the public square, we see where the Union Bank of Tennessee that, um, that, that, that sits on the public square, we find that he is involved in that, at least his, his, his company is involved in that. And you see on this first slide here, this, this, top, um, this, this, this top ad that I have, it says that the board of directors of the bank will serve until the first Monday of January, 1834. This, this, this board meeting is held at his office. Then we also find a steamer being named after him that travels between Nashville and New Orleans. And it's gonna be in New Orleans where he really makes his claim 
to fame. Nashville becomes um, is still important to him, but he comes, he arrives in New Orleans during the late 1830s and becomes one of the biggest merchants down there. Now, where does Hills Island figure into all of this? There's been one account that suggested that Hill may have used um, Hills Island as a as a lazaretto. Lazaretto is a Italian word that roughly translates into pest house. That is to say that um, he may have used this place as a quarantine station. And the way that typically worked would be he would bring enslaved Africans in, perhaps hold them up on that island for maybe a month. And then if they were healthy, then ship them wherever they, he was going to ship them, perhaps in Nashville or perhaps further in the South, perhaps as far South as New Orleans. This is something that was, um, that I'm still working on confirming, but I, I read an, um, an excerpt that talked about him purchasing and going to and, and intending to um, sell enslaved people further down south after he stopped at, and I'm quoting here, his port, his port. The, the source didn't, re didn't reference the city of Nashville or downtown Nashville or the port of Nashville. Uh, it said his port. And so if he's doing like everybody else and he's bringing enslaved people through the, the river, the most likely place for this port would be Hills Island. That, that is to say this is, um, if he wanted, there were plenty of places to auction off or to, um, to sell his enslaved population in downtown Nashville. This one here is one of the most important. This is the public square. At the courthouse at the public square, every Saturday, roughly around two o'clock, you'd have an auction. But if you guys are familiar with this, if we were to go on the other side of this building here and travel down MLK, um, from that first corner all the way to Fourth Avenue North, you had slave brokers who would you know, gladly buy and sell enslaved people for you. So we have these spaces, but none of them um, bear his name. And it's interesting too because Hill's home is not was not far from this place. Um, Hill's house was located at um, was that Seventh and and goodness, I'm forgetting the street, but the street that runs right in front of of the Veterans Memorial uh, Museum. If you look right across the street, you'll see that big Sheridan Hotel. That was where his house was located. So these, he's set up in a spot that was very close to where people were known to um, sell enslaved people. Speaking to his, his riches, um, he owned property all over the city. When we, when I went through the, the tax records, I found that he had property on the public square that stretched from the public square all the way on the other side of Broadway. Some of these spaces were very close to, um, to places where they sold enslaved people on a daily basis. Um, one of the 
city's uh, most prominent African Americans remembered where these markets were located, and they were dotted all along um, Fourth Avenue North. But then he talked about some being located as far down as 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 Broadway. But in retrospect, when we look at Hill, he represents. Um, in, in, in many ways, just how complex it is to understand this institution. Hill was one of the planters that was referenced um, in the history, in a history that was written about African American schools in the city who allowed. Um, um, enslaved children to be educated in these spaces. Hill was noted as one of the individuals that allowed some of his, 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 his enslaved children to be educated. And even when we come to his will, he says this in his will, he says, I want our Negroes to be treated well, he wrote, but for abolition, I should have been able to do more for them. But nonetheless, at the time of his death, Hill had more than 1,000 enslaved African-American men and women in his, in his estate, many of whom were separated from friends and family at an auction to settle his debts, debts after he succumbed to yellow fever. Hill was also a, one of the individuals here in Nashville at the time who supported the, the, um, the annexation of Texas, a move that was directly connected to the enslavement of black men and women. He was also a supporter of the ill-fated Narcisco Lopez uh, expedition in South America that would have, if successful, led to the annexation of, um, of, of, of some Central American land by the United States for the specific purpose of, of, um, of establishing or strengthening the slave power in the States. So he's a, a complex man. At the time of his death, he he owned land in Texas. He owned about a thousand acres outside of Memphis. And um, of course he still owned property here in Nashville. So this begs the question, um, you know, how or why did his name remain attached to this island as opposed to it becoming known as Donaldson Island or something else. I don't have any real answers for that other than um, I do know that when you have a series of panics that occurred or depressions that occur in the United States during the 1830s, um, he would have been able to, to deal with this better than you know many of his neighbors so maybe there's that uh, he was able to hold on to this property as opposed to other people um gaining access to it um this is a mystery that i'm still working on so i don't really have any real answers for that at the moment and still despite the fact that he wanted to protect his enslaved population, um, we see that his, there was a, a great sale of slaves that occurred upon his de death. So much so, and I didn't realize this until much later on, there's a work that I sometimes use in my classes that deal with um, um, the slave auction. I think the title of it is called The Great Slave Auction. But as I went through the book and began to pay closer attention to, um, to um, the names of the owners, his name popped up. 
And also, once Isaac Franklin decides that he's going to give up his, um, you know, to give up his slave brokerage business, Hill was a part of the, the group that bought him out. So on one hand, he remains an enigma. He remains uh, arguably one of the most important individuals in Nashville's early period. But I will confess to you that I had never heard of the guy before um, I was invited to take a look at Hills Island. So that's that part of the history. That's the, the evidence is still sketchy on that, but um, we are working our way through it. But after the Civil War, we um, we find that the nature of the use of the island changes dramatically, and that it becomes a space that is defined by recreation. That is the evidence, the record shows individuals um, coming out to Hills Island to get away from the city, to hunt, to fish, or maybe even just to hang out. And it didn't really dawn on me until a little bit later that this, this, this identity as a place to, um, to get rest and relaxation occurs right about during the progressive era in the United States where there's a push for, um, I don't wanna say creating green spaces, but to, to, to create spaces that contrast with the urbanization of America at the time. It is during this period that this area is purchased by, um, the Seventh-day Adventist church. And this particular church spots this place and, and they set up with the idea that they're going to build a college um, and a hospital and a sanitarium. I don't have any evidence to demonstrate that they use that part of the island for that. Um, I haven't seen anything that suggests that they use Hills, Hills Island for that but its use definitely became important in terms of it being a place for recreation. And the ads that run in the papers throughout the 1920s and 1930s speak to this. Like the one in the corner says, Pleasure Island, new, open from 6 to 11 p.m., fishing, swimming, games. Um, this is off of Gallatin Pike, six miles turn right at Neely's Bend Road. Another ad inviting people to come out to Pleasure Island. You can come out there and you can have, um, have uh, you can enjoy yourself. You can escape the, the, the city. And then there are stories that emerge about the place where, um, where a family would come out there and it's this supposed hermit that would come out there and, 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 and spend some time in a house he built with his wife and family. But what's humorous about this is that um, this guy must have been a relatively wealthy or well-to-do hermit because on Saturday nights, he throws some lavish parties out there. So this, this, this space, which would later be used by um, the YWCA who would come out there and have camps and um, other groups that would come out to Hills Island just to enjoy themselves. Um, this is what defines this, this, this space during the early part of the 20th century. Um, there is, I think, much archeological work that needs to be done that could help flesh out these stories of, of Hills Island that we, that we know. One of the more interesting stories that I've come across involved a group of hunters who decided to go hunting at Hills Island and they pay an African-American man to row them out to the island. So they get out there and they hunt for 
a few hours, then a storm comes up on them really quickly. So they scurry back to the dock where, well, they scurry back to the spot where the, um, where the African-American dropped him off and lo and behold, he was gone. So they had to ride out the storm. And if you can imagine these men on the island screaming during the thunder and lightning, trying to get somebody's attention so that they could come and get them, but they, they fail in doing so. Finally, once the storm ends, they get somebody's attention and, and um, they are rescued, so to speak. And then there's a story of a woman who went out there with her husband and went catfishing and she ends up pulling in like a 65 pound catfish. So this is, these are some of the stories that speak to this place as a recreational space. Initially, I thought that, you know, it'd be a place where Nashville's wealthier class of people would come and try to find some, um, some escape from the city. Um, but it seems as though it was, a, a place where um, many people in the community, if they had a boat, they could get out there. So in, in, in closing, I think, um, of course, there's still a lot to learn about um, Hills Island, particularly its history. Um, there are a lot of threads that still need to be un uncovered. Um, I, I know for certain that members of Hill's family um, um, married into the Donaldson family. Um, but my interest as a professor of African-American history, I, I, I want to kind of look at this place through the eyes of the enslaved. What did that mean? We know that George, um, was able to live out there on the island by himself for a while, but um, I'm wondering if he had any visitors. And if so, what did they do? Um, this is going to take a multidisciplinary um, um, effort to uncover the 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 the. Um, the history of the island in terms of the archaeology, in terms of the, the ecology of the land. And then we'll need some help on telling the, the stories. Um, I would be really interested in a musician who could go out there and, and, and write something, write a piece of music that was based upon what they were feeling at the time, or maybe even a poet or an artist. Um, but it also should be a space, I believe, where we encourage our young people to come to think about nature and to think about the history, the early history of, um, of this place we call home. And, and that does it for my presentation. Thank you all for um, attending and now, deal with some questions if we have any, if we have time. Yeah, certainly. Well, Dr. Williams, thank you so much for that overview. Um, you know, this <clears throat> Hills Island project has been one where we sort of started with this question a little bit around the the story of George and 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 ended up answering maybe a little bit of that and and getting so many more questions that need to be answered. And I think that is, you know, exciting, although it can feel like you know, we ended up back where we started. It's really exciting. And I appreciate the way that, you know, you see the value of, of Hills Island to, to showcase kind of our, our lands and waters in this area, those art connections, nature connections, history, biodiversity, all of those different types of things are really what we're hoping to continue to explore. Again, this is just the start of, of a long-term commitment. Um, if anyone does have any questions for Dr. Williams, you can feel free to post those in the chat um, or or you can come off mute. Um, one of them that we did have, and you mentioned a little bit about uh, Hill's family. Uh, I know another prominent family uh, uh, is the H.G. Hill family in Nashville. Do you know if they are related or connected in any way? I, I, I do not. Um, 
And that might be, if y'all know Carol Busey, that might be a question for her. She has much more of a grasp of the family relationships in the city than I. Great, thank you. We'll, we'll follow up with Carol, we know her well. <laughs> okay. All right, we have a question about sharing your slideshow. Um, would you mind if you share it with me and then I can share it out with folks if that works? Yeah, I'm trying not to laugh because I get critiqued in class about my slides because I don't have a whole lot of text on it, right? And it's like, well, I want y'all to look at the pictures and pay attention to what I'm saying. <laughs> but um, answer to your question, yes, y'all can have it. I'll send it to you as soon as mm -hmm. we get off of here. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And some of those primary resources, like the will where George has mentioned, is also on that website as well. So you'll be able to see um, some of that as well. Somebody have, have any other questions or thoughts that they want to add? Um, let me give you all my email address. So if um, something pops into your head later on, you can just email me. And just be sure to put Hills Island in parentheses so I don't, um, so that it doesn't get caught up in all of the other clutter that's in my, in my, uh, <laughs> in my awesome. inbox. Um, my email address is LWI, I can just put it in the chat, I'm sorry. Oh, great. And Carol is here. So she said she'll check on the HG Hill family, but she's not sure that they're related. And I think we're talking with Carol in a couple of weeks as we round out this project. So maybe we'll be able to have more to report back at that time. But I didn't mean to put you on the spot, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> well, if nobody has any other questions that they want to, to bring before the group while we've got Dr. Williams here, you've got his email address and we'll we'll share out the presentation and again, a link to that website. Um, but thank you all so much for uh, coming to today's conversation, to the presentation, to hearing more about Hills Island, um, for being on this journey. Somebody said with us um, starting this journey, um, you know, we are really honored to work with Dr. Williams. And I think we we got the Hills Island bug in him. So I don't think we're going to get it out, even if we're we're done with the project. I think he will keep digging. And so even from the first time we talked to now, you pulled up a few new things we hadn't seen. So excited to keep seeing what you find and what others find as we continue on this journey. Um, like I mentioned, this is just the beginning. So some of those continued conversations around um, ecology, biodiversity, thinking about um, archaeology on the site and really seeing um, the landscape through a new lens or other things that we um, are looking forward to as well. So with that, I will close today. Um, Dr. Williams, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your work on this, your context um, and your commitment to it. Um, and thank you all for joining. Uh, we will talk with you all again soon. Thank you so much. Yeah.